Welcome to our webinar focused on MTSS during the pandemic. My name is Brandy Simonson, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Jen, Heather, Tim, and Kent. And we are thrilled to be sharing time with you and sharing some resources with you during this very strange time. We are planning to run for about an hour with this webinar. And just so everyone is aware, it's going to be recorded. And Heather is advancing slides for me. So Heather, whenever you're ready, if you could just pop up the overview slide. So during the hour, we're going to do some introductions. For those of you we haven't met, we're gonna share our pictures so that you don't have to be distracted by the video as we're going. And we'll set you up for success with some norms for this webinar. Many of them you'll already know about, but we just wanna be specific about what this webinar looks like. We're gonna then start with some guiding principles that will help you frame the resources that we share. We're all hearing messages that many of us are feeling on resource overload. And so our goal is to share some things with you that we do think will be very helpful, but put them in our overall framework so that you'll be able to pick and choose when those become helpful to you at different points in time. So some of the resources that we will share, Kent will actually share, and those will be resources that our center has put together. Then Heather is going to share resources from our state leaders, from a sample of our states, just to give those of you who may be in different states a sense of what is out there and what supports are available so that you're not reinventing things that may already exist that you could borrow. And then we'll end the webinar with a conversation about what we think the transition to school could look like in terms of supports that we will provide. Of course, none of us know exactly what it will look like at this time, but we'll have a brief conversation about that. And then our goal is to leave some time open for questions and answers at the end. So that's the overview of our roughly hour. And if you wanna keep going, Heather. So in terms of introductions and norms, I'd love to show you the pictures of the presenters. So Jen Freeman, who many of you know and love and have likely seen at least one other time this week or next week in a GIPRA-focused webinar for those of you that are on School Climate Transformation Grants, Jen is joining us and she's going to be responding to questions and answers. So you won't hear her voice today, but she will be very much present in responding to questions and answers. Heather is going to be co-presenting. Tim Lewis, who again, we all know and love, is going to be responding to chat the chat box. So we're trying to make sure that Regardless of how you choose to engage, you will get to interact with one of us. Kent will also be presenting, and my name, as I said, is Brandy Simonson. So all of us are involved in this webinar, but you'll hear the voices of Heather and Kent and I. So we'll introduce ourselves again at each transition. And all of us, as you see in our roles, are from the Center on PBIS. We also want to give a huge thanks and a lot of gratitude to our various supporters from the U.S. Department of Education. So Renee Bradley has been our project officer for all of you who have worked with our center for a while. You know her, you've seen her every year at the forum. And she has been such a huge support to many of us as individuals, but to all of us collectively throughout the 21 years of our center and especially during this time. Rita Foy Moss, Amy Banks, Carlette Kaiser Pegram, and Nicole White are our colleagues at the Office of Safe and Supportive Schools. And they have been wonderful resources for all of us who are working with school climate transformation grantees. So likely if you're a state, you know Amy very well, if you have been supported by a school climate transformation grant. And Carlette and Nicole are your primary points of contact if you're an LEA receiving that funding. And Rita works to support all three of them. So not all of them were able to make today's webinar, but likely, as I said, you've seen Amy and Jen, or you'll have seen Carlette, Nicole, and Jen in their webinars that are also scheduled this week and next week. So thanks to all of them for their great support. So for the norms of this webinar, I mentioned already, Jen is going to be managing the question and answer portion, and Tim is going to be managing the chat box. So when you post a question, please let us know where you are asking it from. That'll help us a little bit in responding, but it will especially help us see patterns in the questions and the responses that we're able to provide. And Jen will, as I said, respond to those in writing, but she may also save some of them for the end part where we can discuss them during the webinar. The chat box is gonna be especially helpful for you to share questions or concerns that you want other folks to see. So the Q&As will come to us, but the chat box will be visible to everyone throughout the webinar. And in particular, the folks from OSSS would love to hear questions or concerns from grantees. So again, if you're using chat, please identify your LEA or SEA. 
And we will be sharing that text with OSSS folks. So we just want you to be aware that that's the function of the chat box. We'll also have a few polls throughout the webinar, so please respond to those. And those will help you get access to kind of some summary information. So they'll be helpful for us, but it'll also be helpful for you as you see handouts to see some of the patterns across everyone who is with us today. And I believe we have it set up so everyone is already muted if you're not a panelist, but just in case anything goes differently, just make sure that your line remains muted throughout. We have quite a few folks on the line and that just allows the audio to sound good. So if you have questions about norms, feel free to use the Q&A. And to get us started with some active participation, we're gonna do our first poll. So given that we are very close to the end of the school year in many of our states and a few states have already wrapped up, we'd love to know kind of what you need right now. So as you think about the poll, this is your, again, kind of immediate needs for support. And we have listed topics that we've heard across LEAs and SEAs, but we also acknowledge there might be things we haven't thought of. So if there are needs or topics that you're interested in that don't appear in the drop-down menu, still select your current needs from those that are there, but use the chat box to share additional information with us. So we'll give everyone a minute or two to to select that and to have a chance to type. And thank you again for participating because we do know that it not only keeps us engaged, but it's also a great way to give us feedback so that we can tailor RTA and prioritize things that we know you need right now versus things that we might be able to hold off on and work on over the summer. All right, and when we are ready, I think we can move past the poll. I think we're likely waiting for folks to be able to access and respond. Um, there's still a few coming in, uh, so I was just giving it a second. And I wanted to also let folks know that the handout um, is now open. So if you try again, you should be able to access it. Perfect, thank you. It looks like it's slowed down, so I'm gonna go ahead and close it. All right, thanks to everyone who is able to participate in the poll. And Heather, if you don't mind clicking us through to the next slide. Um, will we be publicizing that poll by any chance before we move on? Hmm. Ah, there we go. Wonderful, thank you. So as you guys are looking at themes, you're seeing that there's needs kind of all over, but there are a couple that came up as priority areas. So again, thank you, because that's really helpful for us in thinking about resources and TA that we'll be providing. All right, so we wanted to frame the rest of the webinar around some core guiding principles. So one of the things that we've all talked about is during times of crisis, Sometimes there is a tendency to think we need to do more different things. Susan Barrett often talks about it as the shiny new initiative. And right now there's a lot of them that we're feeling kind of pressing on us. But one of the things that we know is that going back to basics is one of the lessons we learn from time after time as we go through different experiences and as we've been through different kinds of crisis. So we want to just leave you with the message that a lot of the things you already have in your set of practices, in your systems, are things that you can leverage, enhance, be more intentional about. But doing what you already know works and really being intentional about doing it well is going to be a way to help see yourself, your educators, and your students through not just this time, but the transitions that are coming ahead of us. Related to going back to basics with our practices is really thinking about leveraging the systems that you already have. So you already have strong leadership teams. You have systems for professional development supports. You have other systems that you've invested in and built. We were talking yesterday with a district who was saying they've been able to accomplish a lot of their goals. Of course, they've had to pivot to virtual environments, but they've been able to keep things going because they have these systems in place and they're able to leverage them even in this unique environment. And always we emphasize the role of data. Now more than ever, we need to be really thoughtful about using our data. And at times we're gonna to have to pivot to different ways or different resources for collecting. 
We know that screening is going to be currently very critical, but it's going to become even more critical as we look at restarting school in the fall, whatever that looks like. So looking at areas of elevated risk and academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs, also thinking about our fidelity of implementation and the outcomes that we're seeing. And while we always use review and make decisions based on data, we're going to need to intensify how often we do that and how often we make adjustments because the context is changing. And through all of this, the MTSS or PBIS framework is your best tool for organizing and enhancing the resources and the implementation supports you're developing. So really being thoughtful about the logic of all, some, and few, whether you're thinking about supporting families, whether you're thinking about students returning in the fall, whether you're thinking about your educators' well-being and what they need, really thinking through that logic so that you can provide really good prevention to all and then quickly intensify based on screening data for people who need more. So that should not sound like anything you haven't heard before. Again, our messages are around going back to basics, leveraging the existing systems, using data, and really relying on your framework. So with that, we're going to transition into sharing some resources, and I'm going to tag out, and Kent McIntosh is going to tag in to share some of the resources from our center. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, so one of the things that we've been thinking about as we've been putting out resources is being really deliberate in what we're sharing. Um, we realize that people are getting regular lists of every single clickable link on anything related to pandemic or distance learning. And we're recognizing that that is sometimes useful and sometimes not as useful. Um, and so instead of doing that, or instead of one omnibus um, thing about how education is gonna change forever and be kind of vague about it, what we wanted to do instead was to provide some targeted small briefs that you can look at that are focused on particular challenges and practice and work that you're doing, and then um, be able to go back to those. Some of them are gonna be useful for you, and some of them you think, okay, maybe I'll hold on to this for a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you four resources that are all on pbis.org and walk you through some of the highlights of it recognizing that then if you want to know more, you can go straight into that. So the first resource, this is the first one that we had put out, and it's our most COVID-19 specific resource. It's a short brief that we tried to get out really, really quickly. And the main points of this is that we're trying to identify how we can use our really good PBIS systems to support students and families during this time. So one of the things we think about is using our good PBIS systems of defining, teaching, acknowledging, and uh, correcting to teach new skills. So some of those new skills are gonna be hand washing. Some of it's gonna be maintaining safe distances, which we know is going to be a challenge, especially uh, for those of you when your schools are opening up and trying to figure out how can we stay uh, physically distant from each other. Um, how do we teach those new skills explicitly? And then how do we teach and maintain uh, our uh, core concepts and values of respect and sense of community and ensuring that um, students are not targeting other students based on their group or where uh, they think they come from uh, related to uh, risk of exposure and so on. And then of course, a brief little bit on reaching out and engaging families in this work um, because more than ever, we need to uh, be able to work with families where they are and provide additional resources for them. So our second one is uh, specific, speaking of supporting families, um, about how we can use our school PBIS systems at home. And this is primarily what we can do to support families in using the really good PBIS systems that we have and sort of being able to share those for anybody who uh, might be uh, doing a little extra parenting or working from home. You know, I know that my kids could show up in this webinar at any moment, depending on uh, what is going on with their assignment or what they're not able to do. And so to be able to share some of those resources, I think is really helpful. 
So we developed a brief that was a collaboration with uh, the Center for Parent Information and Resources. Um, and uh, it's essentially just sharing what we can do to build good PBIS systems in place. Um, so if you move forward, some of the things that you'll be able to see is here is a um, expectations matrix that's specific for home. So the idea of being able to share what we have uh, in that way. And then in addition to that, being able to lay out routines. It's so important, especially for me and my 10-year-old and 8-year-old, for us to have really predictable routines throughout the day is just absolutely key. So it's just basically informing families on some of these things that we're able to do. And this, in addition to uh, the other ones that I'm sharing with you, are also available in Spanish on our website as well. Uh, the next resource is specific for distance learning or remote instruction. Uh, how do we take those good PBIS practices once again and think about using that for remote learning? Uh, and so as we do that, what we want to do is we walk you through how to build a teaching matrix or an expectations matrix for distance learning or distance instruction. So some of the quick tips that we've got is number one, keep your same school-wide expectations. We want to keep some consistency. Uh, this is going to be especially important for students who are used to different expectations for their behavior at home, and they're not used to uh, doing as much schoolwork or school-related things. And so being able to give that consistent language across is going to be particularly helpful. So then one of the things you'd see, instead of settings across the school, you've got different routines. Entering class, teacher-led whole group instruction, if you're doing that, one-on-one -on -one instruction and small group activities. And one of the things that we think is really important is that you think about, number one, what are the online specific behaviors that you need to teach? You know, whether that's how to use your audio, what are expectations for using video and so on. But also how do you take, a, how do you kind of recreate online some of the important social and uh, teacher student connections systems that you have at school? So, you know, what does it look like? Think about what does it look like to greet students at the door when they come in online or when you're doing a morning meeting with students, figuring out how to replicate that so you can have those positive student teacher interactions are key. And then a few tips in moving forward. Number one is figuring out how to take those same evidence-based practices to practices that you use for instruction, whether that be opportunities to respond, um, whether that be figuring out how to how you're going to deliver specific praise to the whole group, how you're going to do that in private chat, uh, thinking about how to respond to student behavior, because we know that if you kick a student out of uh, your online instruction or distance instruction, there is an incredibly high likelihood that they will not log back in the next time you want them back in. So excluding students more than ever is uh, completely ineffective in getting students to attend. Um, a few, uh, another tip of course, is to attend to equity and access. Uh, there's some interesting research looking at how we feel about students or, or other video conference attendees. When the connection is choppy, there is a natural human response to be frustrated with that person. And when we start thinking about that, when we start thinking about who is in a distracted learning space and who can move to another quiet area, you know, one of the things that we know is that there are some students who are more vulnerable than others who may have more difficult internet connection, may have an older device or not be able to access that. And so watching out that uh, we're not holding students to different expectations when it's the technology or the internet connection that's getting in their way. And then the last one that I'm gonna share with you is our most recent one. And that's looking at how do we look at uh, tiers two and three support as we do this. Um, and one of the things that we know is obviously some of these things are gonna look very different. Uh, and so check in, check out is one in particular that's the most commonly used tier two practice in PBIS. 
So what does that look like if you have students who are receiving check in, check out? Uh, one of the things that we think about is obviously it's going to need to be adapted to the context. And in some cases, adapted in an extreme manner. And so when we think about that, we want to think about what are the parts that make check in, check out work for students. And so we know that it's somebody checking in on them. We know that it's positive adult interactions. Uh, and sometimes that means we may not be able to do a session by session rating. So here's one example. We have a few examples of check and check out cards that are uh, adapted. And one of the things that you see is here's one where the check and check out is partially done uh, by a teacher or maybe an EA who's sitting in on instruction with the students who can actually do the modeling and prompting and rating while the teacher is trying to deal with teaching all of the other students in the class. But you can see here, it's actually, this is one where families are doing ratings as well. So that might be something that's particularly useful or that might be far too much to ask some of your families. But we think one of the most important things is can we be checking in with a mentor uh, at least once a week, maybe a couple of days a week to do that. And when we do that, we also want to recognize that some students are actually going to be doing better uh, at home, uh, maybe than at school. But we also have some students who maybe didn't need check in, check out before, didn't need a mentor to be able to connect with. But instead, um, now they really do. And so being able to do some kind of universal screening or check uh, to be able to do that is key. And there's a sample um, uh, district-wide wellness check that's in this brief that you can go take a look at and see if you'd use something similar to that to ask all families out there. So those are all of our uh, newest resources that are out. You'll see some other ones that are coming up. Uh, so do please keep checking in at uh, pdis.org uh, for those. But we just wanted to give you a quick overview and then you can um, uh, look into them in more detail at your leisure. Thanks, Kent. So this is Heather, and I wanted to share with you some state resources that are available um, for folks. And of all the all of you that are registered, I know we're coming from all over the um, the country, and it's important for everybody to know that that there is so much activity around supporting behavior in each of your states. And if you haven't had a chance already, I know some of the state leaders are maybe on this webinar today, but we have state leaders that are um, can be located if you don't know who that is um, from your state. And you can go straight to our website and be able to see and connect with those folks and who the, um, the center partner is that's also working with that state. So I've reached out to um, the state leaders. We try to come together um, every couple of months to share information because there's so much great resources that are happening. And I wanted to just um, share with you what some folks had shared with me of what's happening out there across the country. So I have 14 states that I want to highlight for you. And um, it's important to remember, this is not all inclusive whatsoever for what these 14 states offer, nor is it all inclusive of what all states across the country offer in that there is so much activity um, as I said before, that's happening in each and every one of our states, but I'm only just highlighting what, um, what was uh, shared with me most recently. So um, if you are in Alabama, um, it's important for you to know that there is an Alabama Positive Behavior Support Office. They have, um, have a Facebook page as well as they've um, created some adapted uh, matrices, as well as um, an adapted recognition menu and some technology-based um, for social emotional learning ideas as we're um, in this virtual environment. So I think what's important to know is you may not be from Alabama, but it's important that they may have great information that you can go and borrow and get some ideas from as well. So I just wanna build your awareness of what's out there. Arkansas. Arkansas has a state project and they wanted um, me to let folks know that there's an April issue of the PBIS coaches newsletter that features resources for folks such as coaches, facilitators, 
that are out there supporting their staff and students and families and teams during the pandemic. Um, obviously, there's lots of other information that they have as well. Um, but this can be a great resource for folks that may not be based in Arkansas. For those of you that also could be based in Arkansas, those coaches are supporting other coaches. And so each month they're bringing the folks together in this uh, virtual environment to network with each other, to continue the dialogue, to continue to support each other, learn from each other of how to um, uh, get ideas from folks, uh, problem solve, and be able to best support each other in this environment. So it's important to know that we're not alone in this process and that we are um, continuing in Arkansas, great job with keeping your coaches connected. The California PBIS Coalition, they have been offering one hour resource uh, and practice webinars uh, five days a week, I believe it is, for the last two months. So they still have daily webinars that are occurring um, through the end of May. And you don't have to be a resident of California to participate in that. So um, this is something too to check out. If you didn't know about the California Coalition, whether you're in California or not, there's a lot of great resources that they've pulled together um, and have specific around uh, the COVID-19 as well. There's also an opportunity that if you are accessing their site, that they do want to get feedback from folks that they can continue to provide um, useful information to everybody that's, that's accessing their site. I also wanted to share Delaware. So a um, little bit smaller of a state uh, than California, but Delaware has done an awful lot when it comes to their online professional development and their trainings. They have this online module inventory um, that, talk, that focuses around school improvement with the relationships and the engagement, but they also have professional development um, for staff and helping the staff um, using the hexagon tool um, to you know, help to increase um, the specific needs around what teachers may need out there. They have um, a specific webinar highlighting around how to support um, folks during this virtual crisis during the um, COVID and there's some educators sharing a lot of useful information as well as there's family resources, how to continue um, to provide supports for not only families, but how to help best support families while we're at home. And then we've also, they have um, their website there and they're also on Twitter as well. So part of, I think that's really cool is that it's hard for um, the state leaders to keep up with the other states in all that they're doing. And the last thing we sometimes wanna do is duplicate efforts, but it's important for you to know that there's, there's great information out there and we're always learning from each other and can borrow. And if we find out something works for one person, um, we could certainly see if it could work for us in our state. The Florida PBIS Project. So um, they're having staff chats now every Tuesday and Thursday. Folks can register for that. Um, and throughout this entire virtual learning, but they've also added some new topics to um, their website that's including integrating initiatives, the climate and safety, working with equity, as well as the mental health and well-being. In particular, at the top, they have a, in the yellow area, this new online learning format that goes into specific, um, their live TA chats that they're having twice a month, as well as skill development modules that are up there and instructional videos, along with the fact sheets and tip sheets that accompany those instructional videos. So, um, and all of their, training they're looking at is moving to virtual and will be in that site as well. So you don't always have to be located in Florida to be able to access um, these great resources. The Georgia Department of Education, they've established this Georgia um, Department of Ed community and it's an online community platform providing that peer-to-peer -peer, um, discussions that's facilitated by someone from the Georgia PBIS team. It's, um, they're looking at forming groups, um, it's forums, there's learning modules that are up there. And the whole um, goal was to try to bring these multiple programs that are together and located at the Georgia Department of Ed to better network and best support folks out there in the field. They're launching it this month. Um, and PBIS is actually, their team is gonna be the first team of users across their state for that, which is a really cool 
opportunity. Um, if you're in Georgia, this is an awesome, awesome resource for you to tap into. Um, unfortunately, it's only available for educators in Georgia, but I just want to make you aware, if you are a state person, this might be something to think about. We could tap into um, to find out how it's working, how um, it best worked, and maybe that's something you would use in your state. But again, if you are in Georgia, this would be a great opportunity to get connected to. <clears throat> The Georgia Department of Ed is also creating a new website. Excuse me. And it's content focused, providing resources and tools for folks. That's open to everybody. That's launching at the end of May. And again, you don't have to be in Georgia to look um, for these resources, but they're going to be including everything from webinars, toolkits, data dashboards, annual reports, case studies, all that kind of stuff. So there's lots of... Um, great information that our state leaders have pulled together. The four folks in Michigan, as well as outside of Michigan, they have a brand new website in case you weren't aware, and they have a page specific to COVID-19 um, called the COVID-19 Resources. And they have organized everything specific around um, the resources on how to continue with education during this pandemic on this one site to make it easier for folks. Um, it's specific for educators and teams from their center, and it includes additional links and resources from Michigan and other national centers. So it's a nice go-to and one um, kind of a one-stop shop that they've organized it. So um, it's not as difficult sifting through information. Missouri, so Missouri Schoolwide PBIS. So they've been providing training in schools and districts for a number of years across their state. They're in a tremendous amount of districts and, and public schools within Missouri. And if you go to their site um, to check it out, you would be able to see that they have free curriculum materials and resources, as well as virtual learning modules that they're in the process of developing because um, it's being, becoming much more difficult, obviously, with the social distancing to have face-to-face -face, um, training. So they're looking at moving everything into that virtual environment. Some things that are new to point out for them is that they have a brand new Missouri School-Wide PBS handbook, as well as a brand new Tier 1 implementation guide as well. And those can be located um, on their website. Some things that they're gonna be also putting out this summer is a tier two implementation guide as well as virtual training modules specific for tier one and for tier two. North Carolina. So again, you do not have to be located in North Carolina to access these resources. Um, they have three different sections within their site of integrated academic and behavior systems. There's also the um, North Carolina MTSS implementation guide, which is a live binder that has a tremendous amount of great information around MTSS, as well as a specific um, site if, around the COVID-19 response and various resources that the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction has put out. They have um, developed support for LEAs during COVID. Um, they've created a tool to point districts to the social emotional learning resources. They've provided their districts with guidance documents to capture student information for academics and the social emotional learning during the virtual um, learning process. And they've also developed a practice guide with additional resources and tools to help support um, the return to school. Oklahoma. So Oklahoma has um, established a, a great group of resources around the distance learning. And um, when you do have these handouts, you can click on these links to be able to find more direct information. But they also have partnered with their school climate transformation grant, their Oklahoma tiered intervention system of support, as well as their Department of Education, um, Department of Student Support area, where they've created a family guide on positive behavior, there's a, a behavior management family guide, building relationships, there's virtual and distance uh, social emotional learning, as well as tools to teach, helpful tips for parents, and self-care um, materials for not only parents, but also for educators as well. 
in Mississippi. So the Mississippi Project is referred to as Reach Mississippi. This is a picture of their um, homepage on their website. And this is their specific link to their website with all of their various resources and webinars that they've posted up there to help support all of the educators um, across the state of Mississippi. But it's important to know that they're also available for you to access if you're not located in Mississippi as well. So great resources in Mississippi. The Rhode Island Department of Education, they also had um, developed some great information of virtual coaching that they're doing around their school climate transformation and their multi-tiered um, systems of support teams. And they were using a variety of platforms to meet with their colleagues, their grantees, all their district folks to continue communicating support, sharing resources and continuing the work. And so they've done a really nice job trying to make sure to keep that bridge and that connection going. Um, they're also continuing to kind of do a needs assessment of the evolving needs of their districts um, related to distance learning and specific to how they can provide supports around behavioral health and helping folks understand the current policy and protocol enablers um, for accessing the behavioral health services during the pandemic. In particular, for navigating their way, they've created a website that's around a variety of resources um, mental health professionals and students and families specific to the response to the pandemic. And they have this link directly here called Bridge Arrive. It's Rhode Island's home for all things MTSS um, that they're trying to get people to direct to. So um, I've gone on this website as well. And this is also another one. You don't have to be residing in Rhode Island, but just know for folks that are in Rhode Island, you've got a great resource, but this also can be, there are great resources there for other folks from across the country. The Tennessee Behavior Supports Project. So they have specific resources in response to the pandemic that includes resources for how for educators teaching online, as well as for families for teaching at home because the families were certainly not prepared for this at all. Um, and nor as a family member myself, can I say that I necessarily have enjoyed this process um, and additional strategies um, for what, what to use during this time. They have resources specifically for educators where they have weekly technical assistance opportunities. There's Twitter chats that are occurring. They've established uh, virtual training or office hours. They have tip sheets that they've developed. And then they've also developed resources for families that include quick tips, video series, tip sheets, as well as um, various sample products for families to be able to refer to as well to maintain um, that PBIS framework continue the positive implementation that's occurring, but help folks and help so that the students can be successful. And last but not least is uh, Vermont PBIS. Just wanted to highlight for them. If you go to their website, you can see that there's a specific drop down to PBIS during extended um, school closures and that they've been having live, um, well, live professional uh, learning opportunities that are totally remote. And so I think um, it would be great. Another, again, another great resources. You don't always have to be in Vermont located for that, but they've created also these various tools to help um, for PBIS in the home, to help um, with the educators and have um, some great case examples and, and snapshots out there. So as a reminder for you, um, these are just some resources uh, just across 14 states of what they have done in response to the pandemic. We want you to know that there's all of these resources that are available. If you haven't had a chance to connect with your local um, project with, that's in your state, just know that there are plenty of resources in other states as well that you can refer to. You could always contact um, the center partner that's located on our website that I'd showed you earlier in this um, for more information. And now I'm going to turn it back to Brandy as we talk about getting ready for transitioning back to school. Thank you. And thanks to Heather and Kent both for sharing and highlighting the amazing resources from the center, but also from the states. And I know that for many of us, as we said at the beginning, we feel like we get 
kind of on resource overload. So what I hope you saw through those were the themes that we started with. So each state and our center has really been thoughtful about how we can help folks do what they're already doing and do it really well in this new context. So that theme of back to basics should have been a through line across those resources. You saw states and districts going back to leverage their existing systems and just pivot their strategy to be appropriate for this context. We are continuing to look at data to drive decision making. And in some of those resources, that's a very prominent theme. And we also talked about the importance of having the framework. And you saw, again, whether it's the state or the national resources, those resources being positioned within a tier one, tier two, or the one I'll mention in one second, a tier three context. So a resource that will be coming, not the one in front of you right now, but a resource that will be coming later this week is a resource focused on supporting students with disabilities. And as we are, we have been doing and will continue to do, we're trying to develop resources that will be supportive of the range of contexts that we may experience in the fall. So this resource has tips for families at home and tips for educators, whether they're in virtual or live classroom environments. The goal of this one is to be very short, simple, and link folks to critical practices and then resources that support their implementation of those practices. So this one will come out from our center. We hope to have it posted on the disability topic page later this week. And that will be a nice complement to the other resources we shared because this one will focus more specifically for kids who have more intensive needs. And it's one that we partnered with the National Integrated Multi-Tiered Systems of Support Research Network and the National Center on Intensive Intervention. So it doesn't just cover the social emotional behavioral components, but it also talks about effective instruction and the link between those two. So we're hoping that that is useful for those of you who were typing in the chat and in the Q&A portion around supports for students with disabilities. The last center resource that we're gonna highlight is one that is not new. So many of our communities have experienced tragedies, natural disasters, different circumstances, including school shootings that have led to periods of disrupted learning and times that students were not able to physically be at school. So we have gone through, not at this scale and not at this length, but we have gone through periods of disrupted learning. And this was a resource that we developed back at that time to really help communities think about how to leverage what they already are doing. Again, that theme of back to basics, do it really well and be supportive of students as they come back. So in the green box, you can see the main themes that show up in this resource. We recognize that, as I said already, while we've gone through periods of disrupted learning before, we have never gone through them on the scale that we're going through them on. And so we will be thinking about resources for fall, which I'll talk about in a second. But these key practices around the expectations, around having positive and predictable routines and explicitly teaching the expectations within the routines, maintaining our focus on positive, which when all of us is stressed is so critical, and focusing on relationships. So how do we establish and reestablish relationships, teachers to students, teachers and families, students to students. So really focusing on that connection. Again, looking at screening data, whether it's formal or informal screening data that we can access right now, looking for signs kids may need more, and thinking about really purposefully partnering with families, which is always a good idea, but especially right now is critical for our success and for our students' success. So this resource will be kind of the backbone of some of the things that we think about in fall. So in terms of the paths ahead, <laughs> We all wish we had a crystal ball and we could see a successful resolution to the situation, but we know that the reality is a lot of unknowns. As we think as a national center and as we talk to our partners across different countries, we anticipate that some schools and some districts may go back fully in fall and be in fully live classrooms at least for a portion of the time. We anticipate that some schools will not be able to accommodate the requirements for social distancing in their state. And we might have schools that go back and fall completely online. And we anticipate that there will be literally everything in between. So as we think as a center about developing resources or you all think as states or even within districts about how we can really be thoughtful in our support of educators, families and students, we're all in this kind of game of contingency planning with the range of contingencies that we're having a struggle with anticipating. So given that, there have been a group of us that have been meeting weekly 
to be thoughtful about some resources that would help carry us through this initial transition back to school, again, whatever that means in your state, district, or school, and that would carry us throughout the next year, recognizing how rapidly the context may change even once we go back. So our goal right now is to to start that with having a guidance document that anchors an entire year or maybe more than a year of support focused on this transition period. We will hope to have that out within the next month or so. We are working again comprehensively with other centers that focus on social, emotional, behavioral and academic needs. So this will be a resource that is not specific only to quote unquote PBIS practices, but it will use the PBIS MTSS framework to really talk about an integrated and aligned approach for implementing supports for students, families and educators. So with that, we would love to hear from you all what you are anticipating being some of your most pressing needs next fall. So again, knowing that we did not come up with every option, if you don't see your option there, please use the chat box. But we would love to see some themes across the group of folks on this webinar. And for those of you who are not with us live, but are watching this on video, we'd also love your feedback. So feel free to jump into either the state coordinator contact list or to contact any of the center co-directors. We'd love to hear from you all. Because again, our goal is to develop a year of support or more than a year focused on this transition. And so we need to hear from you what would be the most supportive and helpful. And just as a reminder of norms, as you're using the chat box and the Q&A, please let us know what state and district you're from. It just helps us to kind of think about organizing support and also will be helpful for the OSSS folks as they're reviewing needs and questions. And I think as we're wrapping up the chat, I'm guessing that a couple of folks are still using the, the poll, but we'll be able to share with you just the picture of those results so that we can start to see across this group, at least, what some of our most pressing needs are looking like. And so again, just scanning, there's a range of things folks are highlighting as needs, but we do start to see some common patterns across, including the multiple permutations of combined hybrid in-person distance learning, social emotional needs and trauma. Um, so that is really helpful feedback for us to think about as we're developing resources. And the balance also between academic, social, emotional, and behavioral. So thank you again for those responses. And please use the chat box for things that did not come up through that. So we have, for the next 12 minutes, we have some time that Jen's going to walk us through some questions that came up during the webinar. And then we have one final closing poll just related to how you would like to access information and resources going forward. So we'll do five, 10 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll do the closing poll and we'll wrap up. All right, um, there were a couple of great questions that came in. I'm gonna do my best to paraphrase them and pitch them to our panelists. Um, I apologize if I misrepresent your question, please get back in touch with us if I do. Um, one of the questions I'm gonna um, tag Kent, I think, because the question came in while he was going through resources was about how to um, sort of build consistency between home and school using the parent resources and what advice or resources would you point folks to um, to build consistent supports between school and home, assuming we're in some sort of a hybrid or back and forth disrupted environment this fall? Thanks, Jen, and thanks for the question. I think that one of the things, and this is not gonna come to a surprise, is thinking about a three-tiered approach for what that looks like meaning that we identify what are some resources that we can provide to everybody, anybody that would be particularly useful. 
And then I think a key part is uh, having somebody who they know, who they trust to be able to reach out to them. Uh, It's going to be uncomfortable to say, I need help with parenting for some of our families. Uh, For others, they're going to have no problem reaching out and being able to do that. And so that's why we've um, recommended doing some, not necessarily like intensive screeners, but really kind of a wellness check reach out. So you can find one of those on the check and check out brief um, that uh, some uh, districts in Missouri have used. And uh, I think one of the things is to keep it far more informal rather than formal. So it doesn't feel like a scary kind of referral process and feels more like a, an informal reach out. Uh, and to be able to reach out with somebody who they already know, who they've built a relationship with, is going to be um, more useful than just having a kind of random staff member reach out who hasn't had that connection yet. So I think uh, assuming that families are going to need some more support, but we're not exactly sure who, and also that those support, uh, you know, I know that my needs as a parent are varying throughout the day. And sometimes it's like, I would love advice. And sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, please do not tell me anything else. And so I think assuming, uh, not making an assumption that a one-time snapshot is the answer for that. Um, So take a look at those wellness checks. I mean, we're talking about four or five questions, nothing really big, um, I I think would be more useful than trying for a, you know, 75 item parent family screener. Perfect. Thanks, Kent. And actually a a perfect segue into uh, the next question. So maybe you want to take it first or, or you can tag in um, one of our other panelists if you're done answering questions. Um, but uh, what data sources would you suggest schools use as an early warning indicator that a, a student or a family may be needing additional supports um, heading into um, uh, an unknown educational environment this fall? That's a great question. You know, we're used to doing the idea of screening for behavior support using office discipline referrals. And in reality, many um, uh, uh, many school districts are basically not doing that. Um, so it's important to follow your state guidance in terms of documenting um, challenges and so on, even if it's not a quote unquote office discipline referral. Um, but we're not really going to be able to screen with that information. And the things that I think about that are really important are looking at the quote unquote attendance or engagement data and identifying who's logging in, who is not logging in, uh, who's completing assignments and who isn't and, and being able to reach out based on that. Um, but I want people to be thinking about this, uh, especially from an equity lens and thinking about what is the um, uh, disaggregated rates of um, uh, attendance or engagement or task completion? And then also look at being careful in terms of assessing equity in terms of who we reach out to. So when we reach out to families, are we only reaching out to families if we're pretty sure they're going to speak English at home? Are we only reaching out to families if I already have a relationship with them? So making sure that we start Um, getting pretty systematic with that, but thinking about those different touch points for data as opposed to um, either uh, assuming that we can use, you know, discipline referrals or um, uh, anything else that we're used to looking at. But I'll pass it on to uh, to other folks as well. Um, There was a question, I think, that just popped up in the Q&A, a link to the wellness checks. That's in the check-in, check-out brief. And uh, I will post that in the chat while somebody else uh, answers the question about reaching out to families. So this is Brandy. I think that it, what Ken said is perfect. And I think we can also anticipate some of the students and families who will need additional support based on who needed it before this. And thinking about, in addition to attendance and engagement data, if there are other 
either informal or potentially formal ways to think about screening to set ourselves up for success in the fall. So I saw this came up in the chat box as well. There are screening resources that are talked about on pbis.org. They're under the data tab, or there are also things you can just um, search for under screening. But Kathleen Lane and her team have done a really nice job of an inventory of brief screeners and different pros and cons to various screening approaches. But we do want to think about catching students and families who are going to need more support early. And so I think using prior information and then collecting what we can during this period will set us up for success and having a plan to reassess in the fall because a lot can change between now and then. Heather, anything to add? Nope, I think you got it. Thank you, Brandy. I'm not sure, do we have time for one more question? I think we have time for one more and maybe just as we're answering that one to kind of multitask a little bit, we could also advance to the last poll so we could be talking during the last poll. So the last poll is a simple one. It's just asking for your preferred mode of technical assistance. So for many of you, we have relationships and we are doing some ongoing conversations, but in addition to the things that you're already accessing, what is your preferred way to get kind of the information and the topics that you've requested? And again, if you don't see one of the options there, please use the chat box. So as we're doing the poll, maybe we do one last question. All right, Brandy, I'm going to pitch this one to you because I know it's one that we've had conversations about, um, and you started to mention it in some of the resources you were talking about, thinking about intensifying supports, not just for kids who have disabilities, but also for kids whose families may be stressed um, or need additional support during this time. How can districts and schools be thinking about how to um, intensify practices for those kids and sort of related to that? How do we build peer-to-peer um, -peer connections and try to keep um, peer communities alive um, during this time? Those are both really great and important questions. And I think kind of like Ken said earlier, leveraging the framework that we have will allow us to identify who some of those students are, which was what we talked about a little bit in that last question. And then once we have them identified, we can think about targeted supports that are indicated for specific needs, whether it's managing anxiety or responding to trauma from families who have gone through loss during this time. So we can think about targeted supports and aligning students to those supports based on their screening data, whether again, it's formal or informal. And for kids with more intensive needs, we're now at the individualized level where we are developing and designing individualized supports. So thinking about not just the behavioral needs, but the academic, social, emotional, mental health, that comprehensive support package. And that is where having folks on our leadership teams that have a range of areas of expertise will become incredibly critical as we go back. So we can be thoughtful about the range of needs students have. And I think the biggest message that we have talked about, but I just wanna highlight again, is that that's not gonna be a one-time thing. We're gonna have students' needs continue to flux. And so we always talk about using data to drive decisions, but thinking about the regularity with which we're gonna to need to do that and how we use those data to bump up the needs and supports and how we can then kind of fade those away for students who have come out of that level of need so we can allocate those resources to students who come into that level of need. And I think the peer-to-peer -peer question is also a really important one, especially if we stay remote in some of our communities. So being very thoughtful about how to do that in a technology environment. And that takes careful planning beyond just having a class meeting. So I don't know that we can do justice to that question in the last two minutes, but I do think it's a really helpful one to think about kind of planfully going forward. And as we're looking at the responses from this poll, we're seeing that folks are enjoying the webinars and as you know, we post the recordings. And so let's go into that last slide so we can show folks where all of this is. And before we go into the last slide, we do want feedback from you all because as we were just saying, we will continue to do webinars and we'll use other methods as well to get TA out. So the feedback is really helpful for us to know what works and what doesn't. You can either use the QR code and just scan it with your phone, or there's a hyperlink to the evaluation. So either way, we would really love and appreciate your feedback. We will use it to guide our future practice. And on the last slide, which we might not pull up right this minute, but there is a step-by-step -step way to find these resources on the web. So as we go there, 
you're going to go to pbis.org, which hopefully is a site you're all familiar with. You'll go to topics and there's a drop down menu. And Heather, if you want to just get through all my animation, because I got excited with animation on this slide. As you do the drop down menu, you're going to choose school climate transformation grants because this was a webinar developed primarily for that audience. But although we're so thankful for all of you being able to join, the learn more button will open up more of the content. And there's a table that indexes all the school climate transformation grant resources. So right now, the most recent one is a newsletter. But as soon as we have this recording and the PowerPoint file finalized, they will be posted. Hopefully that will be in the coming days or certainly by next week. So we thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. And for those of you watching this after it was recorded for whatever time of day you're seeing it, we look forward to continuing to work with you in the coming years. And we, again, just appreciate all of the work you are doing to support educators, families, and students back in your states and districts. So thank you.